I'm Kyle Dyer and welcome to Colorado Inside Out. It is Friday, August 4th. We are a few days into Colorado's 147th year. It was on August the 1st, 1876 that Colorado became the 38th state. Here to celebrate and discuss all that is Colorado this week, we have Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward, Krista Kafer, columnist with the Denver Post, Amber McReynolds, former Denver director of elections and election expert, will really utilize your insight this week, and Luigi Del Puerto, editor of Denver Gazette and Colorado Politics. Thank you all for coming. Let's start with a lightning round. In recognition of Colorado's uh, birthday, please just mention one thing you like about Colorado. The scenery is magnificent, but I like the people who are all very different, but can usually get along, as we will prove today. Yes. Krista. What a beautiful sentiment. I'm going to go with 300 days of sunshine. Okay. Uh, a collaborative and creative, innovative spirit oh. across Colorado. Fly fishing. I learned fly fishing for the first time a month ago. Very good. All right. Now let's get down to business. This week, former President Donald Trump was indicted by a grand jury on charges that he participated in a conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election results, which then led, of course, to the September, I mean, excuse me, September, January 6th attack on the Capitol building in D.C. Um, here we are again, but this time it's, it's really serious. It's very serious, and it comes home to Colorado because one of the six indicted is assumed to be John Eastman, the former CU professor, who was still a CU professor when he went and advised Trump that it would be perfectly all right and, in fact, was advisable to have Mike Pence turn over the election to maybe incite violence. And he is now still active here in Colorado, but John Eastman is one of the ones indicted. And one of the arguments that I've heard that Trump will make was, I was acting on the advice of my lawyer. So whether I believed it or not, I was following my lawyer's advice. And you know, anyone should have known better than to follow John Eastman's advice. Krista. I couldn't be happier there was an indictment. Of course, there's still gonna have to be the full case before the court. And I think we're gonna see a lot of information that we didn't maybe know before. I have no doubt that he's guilty. Um, and here's the deal. He's calling, he and his lawyers are like, oh, free speech, free speech. But the thing is, is that we have a right to free speech, but that right is not absolute. You cannot use speech in the commission of a crime. You cannot use speech in a way that is threatening in order to hurt a person or scare a person into uh, fearing for their life. Uh, you cannot use speech to libel someone or a company. You can't say false things in order to destroy another person. You cannot perjure yourself. You can't say false things to cover up uh, the truth on a, on a, on a court while you're at court. Similarly, yeah, I guess if he genuinely believed that the, the election was stolen and he was just saying so, I guess that's free speech. But I have my doubts. I honestly think he knew that he lost the election and he was using speech not only to turn that election, to, uh, to, to overturn a democratically determined decision by the will of the people. He was using speech for that purpose and ultimately to incite his followers, his believers, to not only attack the, co the, the Capitol, but to try to overturn that election. Well, first, free and fair elections are the very foundation of our American democracy and American ideals. And so uh, for me, uh, accountability is key with what we know and we've actually seen through evidence the indictment is actually full of direct evidence of the number of his own advisors, the number of Republican officials around the country that told him that, that these, these conspiracies and lies were not true. The evidence is, is overwhelming, actually, in the indictment. It's, it, the indictment's not about free speech at all. It's about uh, the evidence that the former president, um, you know, attempted to overturn the will of the people, and that's the bottom line. And I think also it's, it's historic, but it's tragic. It's regrettable that the former president decided to inflict this situation and this spectacle on the American people. Uh, it's embarrassing for us on the worldwide stage. Um, and so I think accountability is absolutely critical as we try to heal uh, as Americans and heal the United States and heal our civic health because this has really been detrimental to uh, the civic health of this nation and if we're going to teach future generations about how to be political, be engaged and, and uh, be a part of our civil society, he must be held accountable and that includes us being able to see this trial and see the evidence and see uh, and have transparency as uh, the former president is held accountable. Mm -hmm. Luigi? Yeah, so it's a 
four count, fortified, fortified page indictment uh, that he conspired uh, with others to uh, defraud the U.S. government by preventing uh, the U.S. Congress from certifying uh, Joe Biden's vote, that he pushed fraud claims that he knew to be not true, that he pressured state and uh, federal officials, including then Vice President Mike Pence, to change the results of the elections that, uh, as you mentioned, that he didn't incited a violent assault on the U.S. Capitol. And those are the charges against him. Of course, his rebuttal is that uh, this persecution is reminiscent of Nazi Germany. That's what his campaign said, uh, that he, his campaign said he's always followed the law and that um, uh, you know, this is disgraceful and, of course, political targeting. That's uh, his campaign said. Um, I think, and I got to double check this one, I don't think John Eastman was indicted. I think he was an unindicted co-conspirator in this case, which typically prosecutors would do that sometimes to use that as leverage to get people to cooperate with, uh, with, uh, with the prosecution. Um, I do wonder to what extent this uh, strengthens Trump's hand in the Republican nomination. You talk about healing. Will this heal? Will this have a coming together or separate people more? I'm afraid it's going to separate people more. And I did want to mention, when Mike Pence is speaking out on Thursday, you know, he was talking about the crackpot lawyers, whether indicted or not, John Eastman. When you hear Bill Barr, the Trump's AG, talking about how wrong Trump was, it's extraordinary, but you still have believers. And we're going to see just how bad it is in 2024. This is going to be televised, right? I've heard that the proceedings, they may televise these, so the public will be able to see. Have you guys heard? I, I don't know that the decision's been made. Hasn't been made. There is a process through the courts to determine uh, you know, what's viewable, if we'll be able to hear and see it. I think it's critical that the American public be able to see and hear this. Um, this, this person is running for president, the highest office in the land, and you know, even was noted in the indictment of, of, of telling his vice president that he was being too honest for upholding the, the law and the will of the people. Um, because otherwise it's just a marketing campaign outside of the courthouse, which I think is, is going to further divide the country if we can't directly see it. But, but do you worry, though, that, the, um, that having this on, on camera will simply feed the conspiracy theorists the images and statements they want. I say this because we had a whole congressional hearing, and yeah, it was a bit partisan. Even so, a lot of that evidence was aired, and it only became a part of the, uh, you know, the, the narrative, the false narrative of the conspiracy theorists. So I think if transparency actually got through to people, it would be a great idea, as, as Amber said. But if it will simply fuel uh, the fantasy, um, I don't know. I, I call me cynical. We, we have two tribes, effectively, a Republican tribe and a Democratic tribe. And whenever you go after one of the tribal leaders, quote unquote, there's a tendency by people to rally around that um, leader. We do know that Trump has a loyal base, a very loyal fo following. We know that um, he's connected them with them in a way that really can't be broken. Um, the question is what happens to those party members who are not as connected as his loyalist and how do they view this one. We know that he's running ahead of the polls by about 30 points. Uh, you know, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, is 30 points behind Trump. And uh, we've already seen some stories and some experts speculating that this will just make him effectively um, strengthen his hand and it, in a certain way ensure that he wins the Republican nomination for president. And I think, I think it's important, too, to talk about the flawed presidential primary process we have here because we select president with plurality voting and when you have a fairly large field he's actually not he doesn't need the majority of Republican voters to win he needs what's broken up over six to seven candidates he, he needs a small percentage of that to get across the finish line and this is the same on both sides of the aisle, and, the, and I've brought this up for years big field in 2016 big field in 2020 on the Dem side when you have that situation, people can make it through the primary with simple plurality, uh, which is not the majority. So I think a ranked choice voting model, I've said this many times, for president in both sides of the aisle would, um, would actually be far healthier uh, so that we can avoid someone getting through with a fairly small percentage of the vote. Let's talk about the primary, shall we? 
a topic we discussed last week a, uh, a, has accelerated this week when the Colorado GOP filed a federal lawsuit in its attempt to block unaffiliated voters from casting ballots in the party's primary, in the primaries in 2024. Chris, the state GOP thinks this is going to be the way for them to get more victories. Well, normally I am pretty critical of what these wackadoos think and do. Um, my, uh, my thought, though, I do think they're asking an interesting question, and that is, does a political party have a right to choose its representatives, choose the people that it, um, that it, that it picks in an election um, without having outsiders uh, kind of encroaching on that decision or, or being a part of that decision? Um, and that was one of the reasons why I voted against 108. Um, I, I accept it as law and, and will probably shortly be one of those unaffiliated voters, so perhaps that will be the way that I'm voting. But I, I, think it, I think it's an interesting question, and I, I look forward to having a judge look at that question. Um, I think this is probably the most honest way that they have gone about this. Uh, I say honest because they have another dishonest way of doing that and is trying to deprive Republicans and unaffiliated voters to, the, the right to have a primary at all, um, and that will be decided in, in an upcoming meeting. And they're trying to do it and rig that decision in a, in a very dishonest way. So at least they're asking an honest question. Uh, so kudos for, uh, you know, once being honest. Amber. Well, I'm unaffiliated myself. I worked on passing 107 and 108. I feel strongly about this issue. The majority of Coloradans are unaffiliated and choose to be. In fact, the majority of Americans are actually unaffiliated. And uh, more than 60% of young people under the age of 24 are registering to be no party or unaffiliated nationwide. So to me, this is, this is a, a private political party trying to leave voters out of their process that we pay for, by the way, because taxpayer dollars pay for these elections. And, uh, and frankly, infringe upon the constitutional rights that we have to participate in elections. And so, um, you know, I, to me, it's very clear um, what the intent is. They want to leave people out of their process. I think that's pretty politically stupid, given that when you tell a voter we don't want you to be a part of our process, uh, I don't know how they think those voters are going to come support them in a general election when they can clearly see that, that, that they are doing everything they can to leave them out. And Luigi John Eastman is the attorney who we spoke about earlier who is representing the Colorado, Colorado GOP in this case. He is, as I mentioned earlier, an unindicted co-conspirator in, in the Trump um, indictment. And, um, you know, John Eastman, uh, as far as I can tell, is a very intelligent person with novel theories about politics and government. I, I purposely use the word novel. Um, and, you know, in this particular instance, it is an interesting First Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment question, which is that if you look at all the private clubs, and you use the word private, for example, HOAs, you know, uh, any other group, you have to have a stake in that group in order to vote for that group's leadership. You know, in an HOA, you have to be a member of the HOA, you actually have to have a house um, uh, under your name to be a part of that HOA. And if you're a, a, in a club, for example, you have to pay the membership dues, for example, and be a certified member in order to vote for that club's leadership. So it is an interesting First Amendment issue. To what extent does uh, uh, the First Amendment rights of a group of people, um, to Amber's point, infringe on the voting rights of other people? And I am fascinated, and I will be closely watching how this case unfolds. Mm -hmm. Patty. Well, we talked last week about the Republican Party here in Colorado already doing an end run this weekend with their meeting where people who hadn't voted are going to be assumed to have voted yes, which is that, you know, that they, they won't have the open primary. So John Eastman this week took it to sue Jenna Griswold, sued the state of Colorado over 108. And I want to echo what Amber said, which is these are private groups, but we pay for it. The majority of Coloradans, and I talked about them earlier, they're independent thinkers, even if they belong to parties. They can decide who's the best candidate. That's what I love about 108, which is they can participate if they're unaffiliated by getting involved in a primary, helping Colorado pick the best candidate who is not necessarily the private party's faithful. And that's the big issue here. Why should the people be disenfranchised just because they don't want to affiliate, say, with the crackpot Republican Party in Colorado right now? I do have a, a really quick question for Amber. I mm -hmm. think you're perfectly suited to, to answer the question. What happens, for example, if the Republican Party or the Democratic Party moves into a pure caucus system of 
electing their leaders, which would mean, uh, you know, uh, they pay for their caucus, they meet among themselves, they say to the state or the county, we don't need your money, we're just going to meet via, via our own caucus and elect our leaders that way. I, I wonder what you think if that, under that scenario then, there's no state money if, they, if you think they would be allowed to do it. Well, it's the system we had before 108, right? The caucus, presidential caucus. It was one night, a couple hours. A lot of people got left out. Turnout was less than 5%. Um, and so, you know, the majority of Coloradans will not be part of those decisions and we'll see more polarization, uh, likely more extremes can get through that kind of process, but a lot of people get left out. Military, anyone who doesn't live in the state, anyone who's traveling for business, doctors, nurses, parents with small children, you know, that, a caucus is exceedingly limiting. Mm -hmm. And frankly, one could argue that it violates a number of issues with ADA accessibility, Voting Rights Act, federal laws, all of that, when you think about the, the limitations that caucuses po impose on the electorate, which is why we as the electorate chose to change all of that um, and, and reverse it. So it, it would be a step backwards in my mind and, and it would deeply hurt Col Colorado. I would actually say I think we should get rid of the caucus system. Um, one time, I used to be a, a, a very active member of the party and I printed up 400 cards and passed them out to all you know, all across the, the, mm -hmm. the my, my precinct to come to this caucus meeting, and three people showed up. I brought two of them with me. Oh. Um, it was it, it, people don't go to those. This is not the 1950s. Um, we don't go to caucus meetings, and so the people who do go are going to be the people who are perhaps the most passionate. Passion can be a good thing. It can also be a, a, a an ingredient of delusion and um, and nuttiness. And so I think you're going to have the Tina Peters type people there, choosing candidates that cannot win in the general, that make the Republican Party look bad, and in fact, um, yeah, I, I just think it's a disaster. What would it take to get rid of that caucus system? It, well, for sure, legislative um, action, and you know, this is legislation, by the way, that the two parties have created, right? So all of these systems were designed for the two parties. All the litigation over time, case law, all of this has been in support of keeping these institution, two this two-party system, redistricting, all the changes that have happened on that, we made really good strides on redistricting changes here, but historically, the parties have control, they, they have the power to decide the policies and how these, these things happen. So that's, what's, that's what is kind of the, the issue in my mind, is that we've got a history of case law that was all designed to be in support of the, 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 the two parties um, holding power. And I think the, the electorate, especially the move to be unaffiliated, this is a, a national trend that's been happening over the last 10 to 15 years, and it's not slowing down. Both parties are losing massive share of the electorate because people have more access to information than they did 50 years ago. They have an ability to make selections without being told, vote the party line, vote the whole party ticket or whatever that might be. So there's just this change in dynamic because of technology, because of innovation, because of access to information that um, has, has changed politics in a big way. Um, and, and we, our politics and our processes need to be reflective of that change. Mm -hmm. In the last week, the Denver Metro business community heard from four regional mayors about their city's challenges and strengths. Two of those mayors, Boulder's Aaron Brockett and Aurora's Mike Kaufman, are up for re-election. And then the other two are brand new to the job. We have Yemi Mobilati of Colorado Springs and Denver's Mike Johnston. Amber, all of them came together, shared ideas. A lot of eyes on Mike Johnston, though. Yeah, for sure. We just had the runoff election, and Mike uh, won that, and, and we have a new mayor. Um, it's it's going to be interesting to see. Denver has a number of challenges, and I've been a longtime Denver resident, and uh, you know certainly he's uh, taking taking steps uh, per his campaign commitments to move forward. Um, one of the things I again, and I've brought this up before, I really hope Denver reconsiders the municipal calendar and possibly consolidate, use ranked choice voting to, to choose mayor in the future, and that's definitely something that the new mayor expressed support for during the campaign trail. So I'm, I'm hoping that we see some action on just the structural changes there as well for the future. They talked about a lot of different issues about how we really do need to work together, and yes. I love that idea of we got to collaborate to make our whole region do well. Y yes, they did. They talked about uh, well, they talked about a lot of things. One of the things they really focused on is homelessness. Now, homelessness is a very big problem, multifaceted. 
and uh, it takes a lot of money, a lot of resolve to fix a problem like homelessness. And by the way, I do want to note, none of the major cities have fixed this problem. Uh, we've seen the homelessness problem in Metro Denver grew by 32% in, in, in their last count, which happened in January. And by the way, within that time frame, I mean, they were spending $120 million last year in Denver alone. This year, they're spending $254 million in homelessness. Now, by, by the last count, it was almost 5000 uh, homeless people. If you break it down, that's about 53,000, 50,000 per homeless person. And just for context, what we're spending for per pupil funding is about $10,000. That's how much money we're putting into this problem. So they talk a lot about that. I want to note that Denver has a housing first, or the new administration has a housing first mindset, which means let's house these people, get them off the streets, whereas Aurora has a more uh, work first, um, another approach which means we'll help you but there are requirements you got to find a job you got to do job training and between these two major cities where the homeless people are concentrated they have to find a way to cooperate because you can't just push out you know you do one thing over here they're just gonna crop up over there mm -hmm. okay. well as I mentioned last week that point in time time count showed that Denver's homelessness problem is growing but the metro problem is growing much faster that's what's grown 32%. I think Denver's has grown 8%. But it's bad. There's no question. And just today, Mike Johnston did the first sweep as an administrator. It wasn't um, one of the choice sweeps. It's because of public health, when a rat infestation right by this studio. And it has been bad at that spot. And he's admitted he did it even though there aren't places for those people to go. In fact, for the most part, the people in the encampments are those who've chosen not to go into shelters and get help. So that's the trickiest part of homelessness, whether you're in Aurora or Colorado Springs or Boulder or Denver, how to persuade people on the streets to get help and what kind of help they need. And Johnston is not playing games. I mean, he is working hard now. Kaufman's working hard. But it's a tough, tough thing to solve. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad we've got these different experiments running in different cities to see what works. And I, my money is going to be on Aurora, where you have a, a work, for, work first personal responsibility model. I have concerns about what Mike Johnson is doing. He is, he is such a nice man. Uh, but this week when he said that uh, you know, we're going to give trash service to these encampments, again, that's a kind of enabling. If I were to throw a whole bunch of trash in my neighborhood, just throw it out on the street, and I have seen these vagrants do that, where they just throw trash all around. They, last night there was a guy in, um, in the nature area near where I live. It's a little park. And he's out there screaming. And he's got trash. I mean... And if I were to do those sort of things, I would get fined. But here, if I'm you know, living in a tent illegally on a sidewalk and I want to throw trash out, I get, what, free trash service? So I, I think these kinds of moves to enable, and the, and the, and the vagrants are now asking for porta-potties and, and, and places to wash their clothes. The fact is, is, if they went to a shelter, they could do those things. But at the shelter, they're not allowed to openly use drugs and drink. So they decide I'm going to stay in the tent and demand that the toilets, the trash service, and the you know, washing machines be brought to me. How fair is that to other taxpayers? How is it fair to, to homeowners or businesses who have to live across the street from that? I am hoping that the new mayor will uh, move away from enabling and towards uh, a, a more of a personal responsibility approach that you, you can't live like this for the sake of other people. Mm -hmm. We should mention that this was a really great week for a new Colorado Springs mayor, Yemi Mobilati, and former mayor, Southers, and really the entire Springs community with the announcement that U.S. Space Command will remain in Colorado Springs and its 1,400 jobs, and I read economic impact every year of $1 billion. So that's good news. Big sigh of relief in Colorado Springs. Now it is the time for our show to go about the highs and the lows of the week here in Colorado or somewhere else. Patty, I'll start with you with a low. You know, I brought up the school boards before in Douglas County, in Denver County, but in Woodland Park, the ACLU has now sued because a former employee of the school board down there who what got thrown out of a meeting for daring to challenge someone for saying an anti-gay remark. And he's now been ba busted, thrown out, so the ACLU is suing Woodland and good. Hmm. Okay. I just read a poll saying that 70% of Republicans support Donald Trump. I'm just thinking maybe, maybe the party should have an IQ test. Okay. 
Uh, I think the low for me again is is the embarrassment of this situation with the with the you know that the former president has put this country in in terms of uh, the attack on our democracy and so on it's a low it's a low point in our history it's regrettable um, and I'm certainly hoping that our justice system will work effectively to hold him accountable as well as any of the other co-conspirators. I've had to turn the sprinkler on, unfortunately. I was hoping that we could go on for the next couple of weeks and not do that, but that's my low point right there. Okay, now let's talk about something good. Colorado State University, new policy, anyone in the state can apply for free. Yes, that's a great one. I'm glad the Space Command is staying here in Colorado, but they need to change the name. It sounds like something Mel Brooks came up with. <laughs> I love those two. Um, and then I, I saw the Barbie movie last night with my daughter, um, and I, if, if you haven't read the America Ferrara monologue that's within the movie, so America Ferrara is the uh, actress, and she goes through a monologue about women. It's incredible. Share it with your daughters, your friends, uh, everyone. I w it was very inspirational to okay. hear her monologue. Okay. I mentioned we learned fly fishing for the first time. The rivers are full. The streams are full. So it's been great out there. Good. And you're having some luck then, I hope. Not really. No. no. <laughs> Next time. Uh, my positive, I'm grateful for another year. It is my birthday week, and whereas some people dread having that next year up here, I'm pretty grateful and happy for all that awaits. So it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Um, I'm grateful for you all, our panel, and for you all at home who are watching or if you're listening on our podcast. Thank you so much for spending time with us. I am Kyle Dyer. I will see you next week here on PBS 12.